Well, welcome to any visitors we might have with us tonight. We're grateful to have you here with us and just grateful for the saints of God to gather together on such a beautiful night. Tonight, we remember what has been called Good Friday by the Church of God for a couple thousand years. It's the day when the whole earth went dark for three hours and Jesus died on a cross for our sins. He breathes his last and he says to God the Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And as Nate read, there's a great earthquake and the veil of the holies of holies is torn in two. And the great cost of salvation was complete. And those around say, surely this was the Son of God. So that's what we gather tonight to remember that which I resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. And so may we go to our God and ask that he would minister this truth and reality deeply to our hearts this evening for his glory and our great good. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this privilege to gather together and to remember the cross. God, I pray that you would meet us, your spirit. His role in this new covenant is to be a floodlight on Christ. Holy Spirit, shine. Let that floodlight open up and reveal and show us more the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I pray as we open up this word, God, that you would illumine it, you would open it up for us to understand it, and that nobody would walk out of this place without this Jesus being their Savior. And so God, meet us and do what only you can do in our midst. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. So we're going to be looking tonight. I'm going to set our context. It's Thursday night, the night in which Jesus would be betrayed. He's in the upper room discourse. It's a beautiful description in John 13 through 17. We'll be looking in Luke's account where they're going to go into an upper room to eat the Passover meal together. And Christ is going to inaugurate the Lord's Supper. And during this time, he declares that one of them will betray him. In verse 23, uh, they're going to discuss who that might be. This statement then will lead the disciples into an argument about who is the greatest. Almost every time that Jesus predicted his death, what pursues is the disciples arguing over who is the greatest. Jesus leads them back into kingdom thinking. And then Jesus warned them of Satan's desire to sift them like wheat. And in particular, Peter He says, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And Peter says, no way. I'm ready to go to death with you. And now they've finished. And I want you to look with me in verse 39. And he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. So now they they finished that, that supper, that intimate time in the upper room. And they go out to the Mount of Olives, as was their custom. And this is where they had spent the the night this whole week. And Judas knew exactly where they would be. In John 18, 2, now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place. For Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas would be leading the religious leaders to take Christ into custody very shortly. And so Christ comes to the garden not to hide, but to prepare himself to give his life as a ransom for many. And so now they're outside at the Mount of Olives, and what Luke will record for us in these verses is just beyond words. Jacob said, how dreadful is this place? And wait till you see what we'll look at tonight. So I invite you to come with me to the garden tonight. Jesus is preparing himself to enter into the will of the Father. He's conscious of what the will is. It's why he left glory. He knows what this will is that is at hand. And so he comes to the garden to prepare himself for this will. And how will Christ prepare himself? Look with me in verse 41. (laughs) And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and he began to pray. And then how are his disciples going to be prepared? Look in verse 40. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. 
In verse 46, and he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And so as we come to this moment, we need to be praying and preparing ourselves for the temptation that will come upon Jesus and the temptation that will come upon these apostles. And then Jesus withdraws from them. And now he goes alone and he goes to go to the Father and he prays. And our text says that he actually knelt down, which was a very unusual posture for that day. They would stand when they prayed. And he fell on his knees and he began crying out loud with tears to his father in prayer. It's recorded in another gospel that Jesus said, my soul is anguished to the point of death. So he's brought to prayer. And we look at his prayer in verse 42 saying, Father... If you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And many have butchered this text and said that Jesus was flinching. He said that Jesus said, no man has taken my life and I lay it down. And now they're saying he wants out. He's looking for an escape clause in prayer. That would be to miss this whole text altogether. This is not to show his weakness, but it's to show his holy perfection his love to his father, his pure and perfect hatred of sin. This is to show that he hates all that separates from God. And this is to show the awfulness of the cup that he would drink. And this is to show that he was fully God and fully man. As a man, he would agonize and wrestle here with the will of God. And he will sweat over the will of God. And he'll have to look only to his father for help. And so it's here in this garden that the God-man enters into a trial like nowhere else recorded in Scripture. And he's going to be sweating profusely. Which did not happen in the desert at the first temptation with the devil. But now in the coldness of night, in a chilly, cold garden, he's going to be baptized into a bloody sweat. And there's something here more frightening to Christ than at any time of this point in his eternal existence. And I'm going to have to ask tonight of our text, what is it? What could bring the Son of God into a place like this? I want you to hear John 12, 27. John's writing of Jesus. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came for this hour. And Matthew 26, 37. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death Remain here and keep watch with me. The Greek word for deeply means encompassed or encircled. No place to even breathe. In Mark 14, he took with him Peter and James and John. And he began to be very distressed and troubled. There's something really deep going on in the soul of Christ in this passage. Look with me in verse 44. And being in agony, Christ... And his original nature is infinitely above suffering. And he takes on a nature. Hebrew is a body that's been prepared for me. He became a man. The omnipotent one took on weakness. And his whole life has been filled up with suffering. And the longer Christ lived, the more they hated him and the more he suffered until they finally put him up on a cross. And now he's in the garden at an exceedingly dark time. It has eclipsed any other time of suffering up to now. The Greek word for agony is agonia, and it referred to a great inner tension or conflict. It referred to wrestling. When they would wrestle, they they would wrestle to the point of death. Whoever lost the wrestling match would be killed. Can you imagine the intensity that they would come at a match like that? Or running in the Olympics. If, if If you lose, you lose your life. Fighting. The way the athletes would strive in 1 Corinthians 9.25, it says the one who agonizes in those Olympic games. And so Christ's soul is in great conflict and it's in great agony. And so my question for you is why? What has baptized the Son of God into a bloody sweat? Was it the suffering that he was about to endure? He was the man of sorrows with no place to lay his head. Yet he had peace and purity and calm and fellowship with God all of his days on this earth. Yet now in Gethsemane, the peace is gone and the calm has turned to storm and his soul is in agony. It wasn't over the bodily pain that was going to come at the cross. 
It was not all the punching, scourging, beating, spitting, thorns and nails. There's something beyond the physical suffering that's going on here. Was it his coming death? He knew Judas was on his way and he would die in less than 24 hours. Yet death doesn't cause humans to sweat blood. Martyrs have, have sung as they've approached uh, death and they've kissed the stake before they burn them. Ridley and Latimer, uh, Latimer, as they're being burned, he cries out. He says, be of good cheer, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. And they're praising God as they're burned. And we're going to say that's what causes Christ to be in this kind of agony? No. Was it Satan tormenting him? The serpent's head's about to be crushed. Satan is very desperate. He's throwing everything right now he has against Christ. You have nowhere to lay your head, says Satan. Now you're left alone. No father or angels. All the earth hates you and thirsts for your blood. The Jews want you nailed to a tree. Your friends are sleeping. You have no help in heaven and on earth. All hell is set against you. I believe every demon in the face of this uh, in the universe is tormenting Christ. Yet Christ did not sweat drops of blood in the wilderness when he was tempted by the devil. And so my question again is, what is it? I think it's good for us to ask this question, to meditate and dwell on the answer to this question. John Calvin said, it is our wisdom to have a fixed sense of how much our salvation costs the Son of God and that is what we will see tonight. So let's look at the first at the cup. The cup is what he's recoiling at in our context. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. How great is his suffering for us. Father, if, if you're willing, let this cup pass. There's no rebellion. There's no sin in this prayer. He asked the will of God. Can it be done any other way? which tells us there's no other way to be saved. There's no other name under heaven by which a man could be saved. If there was, that cup would have been removed. If there's any other way to bring about redemption, remove it. And the, the reason it wasn't moved is there's no other way that you can ever be saved from the wrath of God and be made right with him. If not all religions lead to God. There's only one way to have this salvation. Did he lose his love for the Father, remove this cup? No, he was, he was resolved to this will. He's just looking into it, and when he looks into it, he wants it removed because it's hideous. It's awful. And what he sees in that cup has him undone, sweating the drops of blood. What is this cup? In the Old Testament, the cup meant God's divine wrath, his punishment and justice. Listen to Ezekiel 23, 32. Thus says the Lord God, you will drink your sister's cup, which is deep and wide. You will be laughed at and held in derision. It contains much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister's Samaria. And you will drink it and drain it, and then you will gnaw its fragment, fragments and tear your breasts, for I have spoken, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, bear now the punishment of your lewdness and your harlotries. Isaiah 54, it's called the cup of his fury. The cup was the justice and the execution of the punishment of God. And so I want to move forward then is what is that now in this passage? Well, look at me in verse 42. If you're willing, remove this cup from me. So this cup has been placed before Christ. And he's getting a full apprehension of what it means to bear our sins in his own body. Of, of the wrath that he would have to drink to make atonement for our sin. Christ has this in view right now at this time. And he makes three prayers in the garden in Matthew 26, 39, 42, and 44. Three times he says, can you let this cup pass? Let this cup pass. Let this cup pass. It was this cup that had Christ in torment. 
And yet Christ came into this world to drink this cup. And it's always on his mind. He often spoke about it. In Matthew 16, 21, from that time uh, began Jesus to show his disciples that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised up. Matthew 20, 22, Jesus said, you do not know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? <laughs> In their pride, they said, we're able, the sons of thunder. Many verses Christ has this cup in view. And here now, he has an extraordinary view of this cup. The full sense of the wrath that was about to be poured out upon him. It was the greatest apprehension he had of it. And most scholars would say in his humanness, he's now looking into that cup and he's getting the full apprehension of what is in that and what he would have to bear on Calvary's tree. And it's so terrible that his human nature is just shrinking at the sight of it. And I think his divine nature and all of his purity and holiness is looking at it as well. And it's as if God the Father has set this cup in front of him with the full comprehension of all that is in it and say, take the cup and drink it. It's a picture. And the dread which is feeble human nature had of that cup. And he could see the fullness of God's wrath that was about to be unleashed. And what was Christ's human nature to this? The effect that it had on his body is this bloody sweat. That word is drops. It means lumps or clots. It's like his civil war is going on in his soul. And it's just lumps are coming out of his pores. And everything I can read and study is under, under the most amazing amount of stress that someone can actually sweat blood. So do you see the grief that Christ was under? Just to sweat would have been, would have been enough. In John 18, 18, Peter standing by the fire that night warming himself because it was so cold. But Christ's inward distress and grief was not just sweat, but it was drops of blood. And as Christ contemplated standing in our stead, he is baptized into a bloody sweat. And his manhood is fighting it. And his purity is saying no. And his love is saying, bear it. Again, that civil war in his soul. It was as if his, his very soul was bleeding. His eyes didn't weep, but his soul bled. And as he stared straight at the pavement, that he would have to make to redeem all those who hated him was that cup. So brothers and sisters, what was in that cup? It's not death. That was just the vessel that held the contents. It's not the betrayal and the nails and the devil and the mockings and the beatings, but the fear of God that has Christ in this condition. It's the sins of the world. He was made sin for us pure, holy one, separate from sin, will have sin imputed on him. Luther said, concentrated sin. And he'll be the, the filth heap of the universe. And he'll be accounted as the chief and only sinner before the eye of God. Here's Christ looking at something far more vile than the worst of diseases. It's brought greater destruction than any disease has ever brought into this world. Sin brings an everlasting torment away from the mercies and presence, the joyful presence of God. It's not just drink it, but let it be put upon you. All sin of your people, your children, the elect, put to your account, and you being accounted for the sins of the world. And he looks at it and he shrinks in horror. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. And then to realize with that sin now, I will have to bear the penalty of this imputation. I will take sin upon me. It will be reckoned to me. And I will have to receive the undiluted wrath of God for such vileness put upon me. The Father's holiness and justice cannot look away from this. 
The sword must be unsheathed. The death blow must be dealt. And Jesus is looking into the cup of what that was. This for the one who only knew the favor and love of the Father's hand for all of eternity. Perfect fellowship and love. And now he's going to have the disfavor and the wrath of God upon him. That is hell. God against you. This cup is hell. But we would have to pay forever and never be able to pay it. He's going to pay in these three short hours upon the cross. Jesus would be deprived of all the favor of God. Hell is to be forsaken of God. Christ shakes at this. He loved the favor and the nearness of God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I can't live without you. I think back to the temptation in the wilderness. And the great temptation from the devil is let go of the Father. Take something else. Make your, help yourself. The Father won't help you. He could not be turned away from him. Every temptation, Christ would not turn away from the Father. And now the temptation is your Father will turn away from you. I can endure all the devil's solicitation, but I can't endure the Father's separation. B.B. Warfield said, if the distant prospect of his sufferings was a perpetual Gethsemane to him, the immediate eminence of them and the actual Gethsemane could not fail to bring with it that awful and dreadful torture, which Calvin calls the beginning of the pains of hell itself. And Jonathan Edwards said, the agony was caused by a vivid, bright, full, and immediate view of the wrath of God. God the Father, as it were, set the cup down before him, which was vastly more terrible than Nebuchadnezzar's furnace, now had a near view of the furnace that he was about to be cast. And he stood and viewed the raging flames and its glowing heat, that he might know where he was going and what he was about to suffer for his people. His fellowship with the Father has been so deep. And now the wrath is beginning and he goes to prayer and he gets what he's going to have to go drink. And in the book of Revelation, we see the, the outskirts of this wrath and this fury that will be unleashed one day. For Christ, his time was at hand. He puts his, faith, his face to Gethsemane's ground and he hears the crackling and the displeasure of God. And now he goes to pray, and one commentator said, the shock is that the dreadful sorrow of Jesus was not death, but he loved the Father. And when he prayed, he found hell open before him and not heaven. He began to experience the whiff of the cup. Oh, what Christ perceived in that cup. I've been praying that we would get a deep glimpse of what the cost of salvation cost the Son of God to drink every last drop of that cup. And what he delivered us from was that cup. I want you to see how great his obedience was. Father, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. Christ said this standing on the brink of hell, the precipice of darkness, at the heap of defilement. He says, yet not my will. The awfulness of what he saw, and he could say, yet not my will, is absolutely amazing. I will take this cup of sin and abandonment, and I will drink it, so that thy will will be done. That is the spirit-filled man, and that is a true son of God. I want your will to be done. And so it was sealed right there. Our redemption was settled. It's finished. It just needs to be signed with his blood the next day on the cross. And so my question is, do you see why he had to be God? Anyone else would have run like the cowardly lion from that cup. I would have sprinted it, hightailed it out of there so fast. What a savior. Don Carson said in the first garden, not your will, God, but mine changed paradise into a desert. It brought men from Eden to Gethsemane. But now, not my will be done, but thine transfers the desert into a paradise. 
that turns the garden into a kingdom and brings men from the gates of the garden to the gates of glory. Hallelujah. So Jesus says, not my will, but thine as a man. And I need a man standing in my place to say that. I need a man standing in my place to drink that cup. I need a man who will win my victory. And that man, Christ Jesus, it is he. He came and he won the victory because we sang full atonement. Can it be? Hallelujah. Yes. What a savior. And just quickly, I want you to see how great his condescension was. Look at verse 43. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Here's this great struggle. And the son of man had to have an angel come now and strengthen him. How low would he go for us? It says for a little while he was made lower than the angels. And now he's being ministered to by the angels needing help. Just a beautiful picture of our savior wiped out with an angel ministering to him as he goes to drink this cup. <clears throat> One last thought in our text, and then we're going to make application. How great is the desire is to accomplish this. Verse 44. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. In all of his agony, he determined to do this, to give us grace. Christ wants the rewards of his sufferings. Does Jesus just have a passing interest in your soul? Is he just kind of a stoic with a small concern for souls? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Have you ever said, I don't think Christ wants me? I've heard this a few too many times. I want you to come tonight to Gethsemane. And hear the cries and the groans and see the bloody, sweaty ground for sinners. That's why he's rolling around there. To come and drink what sinners deserve for their sin. And I want you to hear this. Every sin that you have ever done or will do, child of God, please hear this, was in that cup. Huh. I've been thinking on that all week. Every sin I've ever done was in that cup. And he drank every last drop. If you shook that cup, there wouldn't have been one drop left. Even my sins. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Maybe you could settle that once and for all tonight on holy ground. All my sins were in that cup. Surrender. Believe. Receive such a gift. Application. This was bad. I've been thinking on this sermon for like six months. So I got 11 points of application. <laughs> I've been listening to sermons and my own thoughts, and I've got a bunch of other people's thoughts, some that I came up with, and I'm just going to lay out um, some beautiful thoughts, and I'll do them pretty quickly so you won't be here all night. First, just consider this beauty. I can't remember who it was that said this, but I loved it. He said, the first Adam in the garden with a tree, obey and don't eat, and you'll live and be blessed and enjoy the Father's presence. And now the second Adam in the garden, there's another tree in sight, a cross. And once again, God says, obey me about the tree, but not live but I'll crush you like powder and abandon you and give you hell. Why? Luke 23, the sun being obscured and the veil of the temple is torn in two. He dies in the darkness alone so that we could die in the light with God. He endured that cup so that we could sit at his table and fellowship and drink wine with him forever. Second, I want you to consider Judas. Judas comes and betrays him with a kiss. Michael Card said that's not what a kiss is for. The more someone loves you, the greater the betrayal. And God is not just some force or power, but he's a person to be loved and adored and at the center of our lives. Sin is trampling God. 
It's not just breaking the rules of God, it's breaking the heart of God. All sin is betrayal of intimacy. The kiss of betraying God and using God. We do it daily. The betrayal of the one who drank the cup for us with a kiss. And how many times we've sat in our Bibles and fellowshiped and got up and betrayed them with a kiss. And I just want you tonight to notice the difference between Peter and Judas. Peter denies him three times and curses and swears. I don't even know the man. But I want you to notice the difference is he, he repented. And so tonight is a, a night of repentance. If you've been running around doing Judas kisses to the Savior, repent. And there are times of refreshing and restoration and cleansing and restoring to God. That's the difference. Repentance. Third, I want you to consider the costly love. I'm going to quote Jonathan Edwards again. If just the taste and glimpse of these sufferings in the garden were enough to throw the eternal Son of God in shock and almost kill him right there in anticipation, what was the actual full experiencing of those sufferings on the cross really like? That just shakes me. It baptized him into a bloody sweat. What was it like to hang on that cross? The cost of love is unbelievable. Fourthly, I want you to consider the timing of the cup. Why now? Edward continues. He says, no one takes my life. Jesus said, I lay it down on my own accord. It was voluntary. It's not to go to the cross and say, you know what? This is a lot harder than I thought. It's too late. You already nailed on it. Here the father sets the cup before him and says, this is what you are walking into. Jesus gives his life voluntarily with that full apprehension of what he would have to go endure. God set Jesus at the mouth of the furnace to see it and to look into it. And this is what you're entering into. And he walked into it and he bore it for sinners. He knew it, he saw it, and he chose to drink it. It just makes it more wonderful and perfect what he did. Much of what I have done in my life, I know up front. What a blessing. I didn't know up front. I'm sorry. Children, I probably wouldn't have had them. Seminary. <laughs> Tower of Doom. I, I've done so many things where I wouldn't have done it if I'd known. And Jesus knew it all up front. Number five. Just consider his heart toward us. <laughs> Everyone's betraying him. The soldiers, servants, Sanhedrin, the Jews, the Romans, the elites, common people, every class, every race, his disciples reject him and his own father rejects him. It's just a mass rejection. Sorry to keep quoting him. Edwards says again, Jesus Christ did not say this. He did not say, why should I, uh, why sh why should I who I am so great and glorious of a person, plunge myself into such dreadful and amazing torments for people who can never ever requite me for it or repay me? Indeed, why should I be crushed under divine wrath for those who can't even stay awake with me in my hour of my greatest need? He loved us. And he went into that furnace. And I'm just telling you tonight, no one has ever loved you like that. This is the love that you've been looking for your whole life. There, there is no greater love than this. Consider his prayer. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours. He's honest about his needs. He says, I'm going to die right now under this. Is there any other way yet not my will be done, but yours? And dare I say, this is the whole Christian life. And a bunch of you are suffering. There's so much cancer and COVID effects and depression. So many things. And this is the Christian life. Not my will but yours. And, and Christianity isn't just running around trying to bend God to your will. It's a submission. It's a submission to the Father for what He chooses for our lives. And to, and to come under it 
Say, not my will, but your will be done. Not grumblers and complainers. This is the whole Christian life under the wisdom of God. I trust his will and I submit to it and I come under it. Not my will, but your will be done. I think almost every one of us in that room need to pray that tonight. Number seven, consider his forgiveness. He brings his disciples with him. He wants his friends with him. Got the inner three. Says, let's stay awake and pray. And they let him down. They're snoozing away while he's drenched in bloody sweat. Any of you got friends like that? What do you do with those who let you down? What do you do with those who fall asleep on you? I love what Jesus did. He said, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Don't hold grudges with those who let you down. What a beautiful example of Christ in that garden. Consider his suffering. Some spend their whole lives thinking about the injustices that have been done to them. That's all you do is replay all the wrongs and everything that's been done to you. And Jesus came and he took this big cup for you, the only one who was ever truly innocent, and he became guilty and he was punished. Can you take a little one for him and be treated unjustly and bear up under it? I'm shocked what COVID did to many of us. Work, parent, child, friend, can I take a little bit of injustice for the one who bore the greatest one in my place? Number nine, consider the lost. Consider the lost. That cup is what they're going to bear. And if it baptized the Son of God into a bloody sweat, how do we ignore that and act like our car is more important, our houses, our appearance? This is what people are under. And Jesus drained it. And we get to lift high that and call people to it. Come, come to it. If you come to Christ, that cup, what's in that, will be off you. There'll be no more condemnation for you. And we need to not just be a church that learns the Word of God. You got to be a church that takes that message to everyone and anyone you can. And if you don't want to do that, you got to wake up and look at this cup. Go share this with the lost. Consider this gospel. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God treats Jesus as if he did everything that you did wrong. And God will treat you as if you did all that Jesus did. Imputation. God will actually treat you as if you drained that cup. There's no more wrath. It's gone. And he'll treat you as if you lived the life that Jesus lived. What a beautiful gospel. That's what he offers to you tonight. To be that accepted and that forgiven. That's the heart of the cross. And my number 11. I want you to rest in his deep, deep love. This is what I've prayed for every one of you. You can't wear his love out. It's so easy to wear out people's love in this world. Show hands if you ever have. It's my spiritual gift. And we think God's the same. And I want you to just catch this last thought. You can't wear out God's love. And just consider this. If that cup didn't break Jesus' love for us in Gethsemane. Will what you did this evening break it? Oh, it should take your breath away. The deep, deep love of Jesus. Look at Christ dying in the dark for you so that you could live in light of God's love and his presence. And now...
we get the joy of coming to the table and, and remembering what put, baptized him into that bloody sweat. He did go and he went to Calvary's tree and he did bear that wrath. And we're going to come and remember now the body that was broken and the blood that was spilled out and draining that cup so that I can have full atonement and forgiveness and acceptance with God. So let's pray and then we will pass out the elements. And Father, I come before you and we are on holy ground. God, the garden of Gethsemane, what is preached to us and proclaimed. Amazing love, the deep, deep love of Jesus. God, that he loved you so much that he wanted your will. And he loved us so much that he was willing to take our cup, the cup that we deserved. And now we share in that cup of blessing. God, I pray tonight that every heart is overwhelmed and blessed by this beautiful, sweet Christ. I would hate my own soul if I found it not loving Christ. And I want everyone in here to know that every one of their sins were in that cup. Oh God, there's none that was not punished on that cross. Let them hear that. Let them see it, feel it, taste it, and drink it tonight. God, set people free who are under weights and burdens and sins. Let tonight be a night of repentance. Let us be as Peter and turn back toward our Savior and not want to pull a Judas and kill ourselves and quit. God, grant repentance and sweet faith tonight. Hallelujah. What a Savior we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.